welcome everybody to our uh, seminar series, Joy and Felicity, the Prayer Book and Monarchy. I'm Rebecca Swire, one of the trustees of the Prayer Book Society, and it's very good to welcome you all this evening. Our series continues this evening with the Reverend Canon Professor Sue Gillingham, who's going to be presenting uh, on the Royal Psalms on the Psalter. Can I remind you also that the four previous seminars in the series are now available to watch on the prayer book website if you'd like to look at them, if you missed them or you'd like to look at them again. The final seminar is going to be next Tuesday, which will be Eleanor Parker focusing on the Royal Saints in the prayer book calendar. And being that that is Holy Week, I suspect that some of us won't be able to watch it on the day. But again, that will be available afterwards on the website to catch up on. And you can, of course, also find details on the website of how to join the Prayer Book Society or, of course, to, to give a donation. Um, before I introduce Sue and then kick off the evening with a prayer, just a word about practicalities. There will, after the talk, be a chance to ask Sue some questions or to make comments. And I will ask people to raise their hands using the reaction button or typing a comment or question into the comments box. Can I ask you all to please keep yourself muted throughout the talk, unless we get to that, obviously, that point when you're called to ask a question. So first of all, before we get to the talk, I just wanted to introduce Sue briefly to you. Sue Gillingham is an Emeritus Professor of the Hebrew Bible at the University of Oxford. She's Senior Research Fellow at Worcester College, Oxford, and Director of the Oxford Taught Psalms Network. And she's been working for some 23, 20 years on a three volume commentary on the Psalms, examining their reception history in both Jewish and Christian traditions through sermons, commentaries, liturgical practice, prayer, art, music, drama, poetry, film, as well as through political and ethical discourse. Two psalms of two volumes of Psalms for the Centuries have already appeared in print, and the final volume is due out in June 2022. So there's a little bit of free publicity for that soon. She was ordained as a permanent deacon in 2018 and is licensed to the parish of St Barnabas and St Paul with St Thomas the Martyr in Oxford and was also installed as canon theologian in Exeter Cathedral in 2018. Um, and she's published a number of books, some 10 overall and 80 papers, both nationally and internationally, many of which are on the Book of Psalms. Sue is coming this evening very much from the, this background as a biblical scholar. Um, and we look forward to learning from her expertise and enthusiasm, because the Psalms are, of course, a central part of the Book of Common Prayer. And I know her hope is in this evening, the purpose is to help us to get to know and love the Psalms even better as such an important part of the Book of Common Prayer. But before I hand over to Sue, can we start in prayer? We beseech the Almighty God mercifully to look upon thy people, that by thy great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore, both in body and soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord our God, who upholdest and governest all things by the word of thy power, receive our humble prayers for our sovereign lady Elizabeth, as on this day set over us by thy grace and providence to be our queen, and together with her, bless we beseech thee, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family, that they, ever trusting in thy goodness, protected by thy power, and crowned with thy gracious and endless favour, may long continue before thee in peace and safety, joy and honour, and after death may obtain everlasting life and glory by the merits and mediation of Christ Jesus our Saviour, who with thee and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen.
Now I'm very pleased to hand over to Sue, who's going to just do a screen share. So hopefully we can all see her presentation. Well, thank you so much for the welcome, Rebecca. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's a very strange feeling doing a talk like this in your living room with many faces that you can't see and many, obviously, everybody muted. But I hope somewhere you're going to get communication uh, of my enthusiasm for the Book of Psalms. And as Rebecca said, what I'm going to do to start with is introduce the, the Psalms to you from a biblical point of view, showing you one or two of the problems of the Royal Psalms in their context, and then taking it through the New Testament and moving into the things that you are more familiar with, obviously applying it very much to, in, in some ways to cover their Psalter. So here we go, the Royal Psalms in praise of the King. The first question is, how do we interpret a Royal Psalm? Quite simply, by Psalms which have a specific reference to the King. But there are only really nine Psalms of this nature, although there are two others, 101 and 144, which suggest by their contents that the ruler might be the king. I've included them here. Two other Psalms, 61 and 63, have one verse of a prayer to the king, but their contents don't suggest anything royal, so I've left them out. And there are about 10 others where you could argue the royal figure might be hinted at, although not explicitly stated as the king. So again, I'm focusing just on what is clear. This might be a surprise to some of you that there are actually just 11 so-called royal psalms. Isn't the Psalter called the Psalms of David? The title is actually found in only 73 psalms, i.e. only just over half the Psalter. It's interesting to see how in time this association with David, player of the lyre or harp, became a means of identifying the entire book of psalms. So straight away, we need to be clear what this heading of David means. It doesn't necessarily denote authorship. In the Hebrew, it doesn't mean by David so much as for David, i.e. its force is what we might say is dative rather than genitive. It's a dedication to David, not just, just as the Psalms of Korah are dedicated to a guild of singers under the name Korah. We can see this in, for example, the dedication to David in Psalm 30, which states a psalm, a song of dedication to the of the temple of David. As the temple was built after David's time during the reign of his son Solomon, this could not be intended as a psalm by David, but rather a psalm in memory of him, dedicated to him from a later time. So gifted psalmists, many probably in the court of the king, would write their hymns and prayers in memory of this great figure, modeling their piety on his. So David is not the author of every psalm which has this heading, Le David. It means for David. This explains why the heading, Le David, to David, of David, is not found in every one of these 11 psalms. Psalm 2, for example, has no heading at all. Psalms 45, 89, and 132 have musical and liturgical headings, but no reference to David. And Psalm 72 is addressed to Solomon. So only the other Psalms have headings to David, and these may not have been written, these may have been written in memory of David or a king of the Davidic line after him. It seems that the royal Psalms are the work of court scribes. Psalm 45, for example, starts by comparing his tongue with the pen of a ready scribe. The inspiration comes word by word, and the words become immortalized in written form. So these 11 Psalms would have been written for different occasions in a king's life. One final thing, note how the few, these few royal Psalms are spread throughout the Psalter. They're not arranged according to type, nor even chronology within the Psalter as a whole. And in fact, probably the very earliest Psalm 132, which is about David bringing the ark to Jerusalem is in fact near the end. Now I've got to make this as clear as possible. So I'm going to offer you two charts, just two to start with. They're the only ones I'm going to use, but the Psalter is a complex work. And sometimes it's easy to see how it can be broken down into smaller parts and see how the Royal Psalms fit into it. So here we go. The Psalter is divided into five books of an equal, an even length. Within the five books are a number of small collections. We also find odd Psalms included, which are not part of a single collection. So book one, 
It's an uncomplicated and basic collection. It's prefaced by Psalms 1 and 2, neither of which have Davidic headings, but introduce the themes of the law and the king, the two key covenants for the people at the beginning of the book as a whole. All but two Psalms between Psalms 3 and 41 have a heading, this heading for David. This is indeed the little Psalter for David. The Psalms here are merely individual complaint, complaints and laments interspersed occasionally with hymns to God as creator, which interrupt that flow of despair. Psalms 8, 19, 29. At the end of Psalm 41 is a doxology announcing book one has ended. Book two has another Psalter of David, except the name for God is usually quite different than in book one. Some Psalms are identical, e.g. Psalms 14 and 53 on the fool not knowing God, but the names for God are different. To this collection has been added a small group of Psalms dedicated not to David, but to Korah, a choir guild. We see, we see too an isolated psalm to Asa, another choir guild, set between these two larger collections. At the end of Psalm 72 is another doxology announcing book two has ended. So book one, Psalms one to 41, book two, Psalms one to 72. Book three has just one psalm, 86, with a Davidic heading. This continues the collection of psalms dedicated to Asaph, making 12 Asaphite psalms in all. So this is added another half collection for Korah and associated guilds, again, making, the, the, making the, the 12 in all. At the end of Psalm 89 is a doxology announcing book three has ended. So book three, Psalm 73 to 89. Four is quite different. Little collection of Davidic Psalms in the middle, but the two main collections are assembled according to their theme, the kingship theme, 93 to 100 and 104 to 106, with Alleluia being the key theme of the 104 to 6 and the kingship in, in 93 to 100. A small collection of Psalms at the very beginning, 90 to 92, is associated more with Moses. Yes, Moses, which interestingly complement the handful of Psalms to David in the middle. At the end of Psalm 106, is a doxology announcing book four has ended. Book five is more complicated, suggesting its process of growth emerged over a period of time. Two Alleluia Psalms, called the Hallel, Psalms with Hallelujah in, in them are prominent. And there's 15 Psalms of Ascents lies near the middle. Just before the Psalms of Ascents is Psalm 119, which is longer than the whole of the 15 Psalms of Ascents put together. There are two more short Davidic collections, 138 to 144 and 108 to 110. And then 107, which is like 106 in style, is the preface. And that is book five as a whole. So where are the royal psalms in all this? Scattered throughout, as you can see. They do not form a specific collection, nor are they all in collections with Davidic headings. They're a random group, Noticing, no, noticeable only on account of their contents. I'm now going to take you through a different chart, and this will be the end of it, I promise you, but I felt it was necessary to, to make it clear. I'm going to take you through a second chart, which actually looks at the purpose of the Royal Psalms in a different way. This chart shows us the, the different, sorry, my, my headings have come up when I checked it before, and hadn't realized that some of them have come up, but it shows us the different liturgical and literary types of Psalms, hymns, laments, and miscellaneous forms. Let's look forward first at the hymns. These have a good deal in common with ancient Near Eastern hymns in Babylon. For example, that the users start with a call to praise and the middle offers reasons for it and end with another call to praise. That's the standard form. Some stress God's love God as king, others stress his love of Zion. And you remember that some of those kingship psalms come in the latter part of the Psalter which I showed you earlier. The second category is laments. These again have many ancient Near Eastern correspondences and their typical form is a cry for help, then a description of distress and a promise to praise God if the prayer is heard. That makes 85 psalms in all. And like the royal psalms, both hymns and laments are found in different places of the Psalter, though the laments dominate the beginning and praises are more prominent at the end. And now the third category, made up of different miscellaneous forms. We have the thanksgivings, 
which move beyond general praise to God, being more specific, thanking God for particular help at a particular time, 18 in all. We have Psalms expressing quiet trust and confidence in God, 14 in all. We have three Psalms which offer us insights into liturgical practices, perhaps involving the ark. We have Psalms which address the community um, rather than God, didactic Psalms teaching the congregation in matters of piety, and some of them reflect psalms like Psalm 1, more individual and personal. We have eight psalms where the eye seems to be God speaking through a prophetic figure, admonishing the people for the lack of, for the lack of faith, some of which have a historical focus. And in this category, we have the royal psalms, psalms for the king to use, psalms written by gifted court composers. This helps you to see that the royal psalms are typical of the rest. They do not all occur in one single collection. They spread throughout the Psalter as a whole. If the Psalter did develop as a kind of temple hymn book, which I think they did, the compilers didn't consider comp uh, placing all the royal psalms in one place, but they didn't place all the hymns in one place, nor all the laments. So the distribution of royal psalms isn't a unusual. Let's now look at the different sorts of royal psalms in more detail. There seem to be three which focus on the, cor on the coronation or accession of the king. These are Psalms 2, 101, and 110. Another is about the anniversary of the king to the throne. And here the title is ascribed to Solomon. Here, yeah, 72. Four are about the king's military success, 18, 20, 21 and 89. One is a wedding psalm, which shows the honor to which, in which the king was held, is called, his throne is called divine. One is a liturgy, which enacts God's promise to the king and David's oath to back to God, that he'll promise him loyalty in return. It contains some quite ancient liturgical fragments. That's just one of the oldest psalms, 132. And then um, we, the two that don't mention the king, Psalms 101 and 44, have a figure whose piety and authority is a jester royal figure faced with looking after his household in, in, in 101 or in battle in 144. So another complication. Not only are the royal psalms scattered through the Psalter, but they're all not about the same royal concerns. It's quite likely there were many other royal psalms, but these 11 were eventually included in the Psalter reflecting different types of psalmody. They've probably come from the, li the lives of kings from David to Solomon, and perhaps much later, Hezekiah and Josiah. It might indicate why they were placed in different parts of the Psalter as this anthology grew and developed in coherence. Let's just look now at six examples, which are illustrating uh, the variety in more detail. Notice we now have Coverdale. Psalm two, written for the accession of the king, has a specific promise in the middle of it to make the point that despite the threatening forces of foreign nations, God will protect his king and his city, Jerusalem. Psalm 21 is a prayer asking that the king will have victory in battle. Psalm 45, that wedding psalm, shows at the very beginning the, the role of the court composer comparing his tongue like a red scribe in the Hebrew, but the things, the speaking of the things I've made unto the king. Psalm 72 is a psalm celebrating the anniversary of the king's accession, again written by a court scribe, encouraging the king to perform his decrees with justice and righteousness. Psalm 89 is a composite psalm. Uh, remembering the anointing of the king, but ending with a remonstration for God for forgetting the promises because the king seems to have been taken into captivity. And Psalm 110 speaks of the king in a priestly role, perhaps at times of war, giving us insights into the relationship between the king and the temple cult. What is clear is that in every one of these royal psalms, they contain, posi contain positive affirmations of the role of the king. This might seem to be an obvious characteristic of royal psalms. However, it's not typical of the view of the king in many other texts in the Hebrew Bible. 
Everywhere else in the Hebrew Bible, well, not everywhere, but in many, many other places, there's a highly critical view of kingship. This passage about the king keeping the law is a very good example. It's very different from the royal Psalms, which praise the king, seeing him in a close and intimate relationship with God. Here, the king's relationship is conditional upon his reading the law publicly and keeping it. And you could argue that the entire book of Samuel and Kings is based on the assessments as whether or not the kings actually did exactly what was required in this law in Deuteronomy. This critique of royal privilege is found many times in the books of Samuel and Kings. Here's an example from David himself, made by his court prophet, Nathan, because of his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of her husband, Uriah. Hardly in the nature of the royal Psalms. Or again, this is an example of the announcement of punishment on a northern king by Elijah the prophet. Notice here, King Ahab calls Elijah, mine enemy. This is another announcement of judgment on the northern king, here by the prophet Amos, a century or so after Elijah. Amos was very much an outsider prophet, called from being a shepherd to speak out as a prophet in the northern kingdom. Amos was fearless in his criticism of Jeroboam. Despite the king being an apparent, apparently successful in terms of his economic growth of the kingdom and the expansion of the kingdom uh, throughout all that part of the ancient world. Nevertheless, he failed in his duty to keep the law and to act in justice and righteousness. And finally, we have a typical account of a failed southern king by the writer of two kings near the end of two kings. Manasseh could not do a thing right. He failed in every aspect of keeping that law. So the question is, what did the royal Psalms kept as poems and prayers in praise of the king have to do with the portrayal of the kings in the law and the prophets, and indeed in the history too? In these indictments, we see the reality of kingship, where very few kings were actually praised for their obedience. So are the royal Psalms just about an ideal? Do they have anything to do with reality? To understand this question in part, we turn to the ancient Near East and the understanding of kingship there. Almost all the ancient Near Eastern artifacts we've found are actually more like the royal Psalms in praise of the prowess of the king. I've chosen three examples, all on different materials and actually each by a coincidence, having a reference to the might and power of the king, but in each case, citing a victory over the kings of Israel and Judah. They're all to be seen in the British Museum. This black obelisk, or basalt stone, is actually the first reference to a king of Israel outside the Bible. It's a large standing stone and records the defeat of King Jehu of Israel on the second line down as he kisses the feet of the Assyrian king and gives him tribute. Many other Assyrian victories are recorded on this pillar, here in honor of King Shalmaneser III of Assyria and his military prowess. Here, the Taylor prism is much smaller and has six sides with a hole in the middle so that using some sort of pole, it could be spun round to read out the victories of the king. Here, it speaks of King Sennacherib, also of Assyria, shutting up King Hezekiah of Jerusalem by siege like a bird in a cage. All six sides speak of the various victories of the king. And then the Babylonian Chronicle. It's smaller still, set on a clay tablet. This speaks of the glory of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, how he gained the, the territory of the Hattiland, that's the Babylonian term for Judah, and how he took King Jehoiakim captive to imprisonment in Babylon. Again, this whole clay tablet is in praise of the, of, of the king's victories in that region. So why should this particular group of Psalms have more in common with political ideology of the ancient Near East than the rest of the biblical literature, which is so much more critical of kingship? In brief, why should the kings get such a good press in the Psalms? In part, it's because as we've noticed, noted already, the royal Psalms were composed of, by royal scribes for the king to use at various royal occasions, such as the king's wedding, or accession, or winning a military victory. This would have been performed probably to song and music in the temple. Texts like Deuteronomy 17 were written in a different setting 
those prophetic texts criticizing the king were also spoken and written by those not paid for their services. Hence, they could be fearless about their indictment of the king. They could afford to be independent witnesses, whereas royal scribes were writing royal songs for the king to use. Of course, today, several scholars question even the existence of David in the early start of the monarchy in about 1000 BCE. They'd argue there's no external evidence for this king, and all we know is found in the Hebrew Bible. About 10 years ago, large claims were made for the discovery of one of King David's palaces here in the photo. Not all have been persuaded by the evidence, but it's interesting how archaeology is coming up with some other um, interesting counterpoints. Whatever view we take of David, it's hard to deny the existence of the monarchy by at least the 8th century. Think of those three artifacts, three artifacts I've just showed, which refer to different kings, such as Jehu in the north, Hezekiah and Jehoiakim in the south. They refer to outside the Bible. In my view, it's too skeptical, and I know I'm fighting some of my contemporaries and colleagues, it's too skeptical to deny the existence of the monarchy altogether. There are too many witnesses and too many different and types with uh, references to King David and the kings throughout the Hebrew Bible, whether in the Psalms positively or the prophetic books and histori historiography more negatively. So in my view, I think the royal Psalms are primarily compositions for the king to use on all manner of occasions, and a couple of them compositions for the king to use in private. There might not, might not be many of them, and they don't form one coherent collection, but they give us an important and independent witness to the high esteem of the kingship in the temple and palace circles in Judah. But we have another problem. <laughs> Even if we take a positive view of David and the monarchy, as reflected in the Psalms, it's evident that the monarchy actually only lasted for some 400 years. That's a small part of the Bible's, his 2000 year Hebrew Bible's, Old Testament's Bible history over all 2000 years. Obviously if you add on the New Testament, it's longer. So maybe this is a third chart and I'm cheating, but it's more simple than the other two, although it covers an incredible amount of history. It starts in Iron Age II in about 1000 BCE, which is convenient and approximate date we used to start for David's life, about 1000 BCE, with its account in Samuel and Kings of the way the kingdom was united under this great king. The unified kingdom continued into the reign of David's son Solomon in about 950, who according to the Book of Kings was responsible for the building of the temple. After this, the kingdom was split into two. The northern kingdom was called Israel and the south was called Judah. Israel was defeated by the Assyrians and their capital Samaria was destroyed in 721. Judah was defeated by the Babylonians and their capital Jerusalem was destroyed in 586. After this, the king was never restored to the throne. So this is the period of international alliances, international trade, victory and defeat in war, building projects, arranged marriages, worship as a state religion in the temple, pride in nationhood, and even with these 11 or so world psalms. A period always marked by the critique of the prophets who always constantly reminded the people of the, the kings had privilege and responsibility went hand in hand. Thus we have a 400 year period for the monarchy. The period of the exile in Babylon lasted some 40 years, but its impact on the loss of the monarchy was immeasurable. The Persians defeated the Babylonians and in 538 allowed the Israelite people, now known by their ethnic name, the Jews, back into their land. But they were not allowed to make anyone of the Davidic line their king. Instead, they were forced to create a theocracy centered on the priestly authority from the temple. So this again raises the question, we have royal psalms in our Psalter. Set, a, set amidst many other psalms, some also dating from the period before the exile, others dating from the period time of the exile itself, and many dating from after it and the restoration to the land. So why were the royal psalms preserved if there was, why, sorry, I'll say that again more clearly. Why were the royal psalms preserved if there was no longer a monarchy for them to serve? The brief answer is in hope. Hope that what the then Jewish people saw as God's covenant with David would one day be restored. Psalms which were written and used to serve the actual monarchy became used to serve an imagined, hoped for monarchy. Despite the frequent criticism of the monarchy, the 
prophets also expressed a profound hope for the reinvention of the monarchy with an idealized future Davidic king. Let's look at how this bit might work out with the royal psalms we looked at earlier. Let's take the psalms about battles first. Psalms 2, 18, 20, 21, 89, and 144. These now refer to the future battle led by a messianic warrior-like figure against all the people's enemies, especially those who had oppressed them. Then let's take the psalm which are about the accession of the king to the throne. Psalms 2, 72, 101, 110, and 132. These psalms spoke about God's choice of a future figure of the Davidic line, emphasizing how the covenant with David would one day be renewed. Psalm 45, the wedding psalm, is different. It extols the king at his throne as being divine, speaking of the uniquely close relationship between the king and God. But this intimate relationship between God and the king is also found in Psalm 2, where God calls the king his son, and also in Psalm 89, where the king addresses God as his father. So these psalms were used to speak of how the coming figure would have a uniquely intimate relationship with God. The Jewish people have continued to use the Psalms to further this hope up to the present day. The royal Psalms are about a messianic figure of the Davidic line who will have an intimate relationship with God and who will lead them against their enemies. The first Christians were Jews and they too had this royal hope. The Psalms, including the royal Psalms, were no longer in Hebrew, as we see from the great Psalms scroll at Qumran, but they were in Greek. Sorry, the two have got exchanged in the other direction. <laughs> the Qumran scrolls at the bottom and the Greek is, of course, at the top. So the Jewish Christians began to read all the Psalms, including the royal ones, in the light of the life of Jesus, which inspired their growing belief in his being the Messiah. The disciples began to realize that Jesus were no, was no ordinary king, but after his death and resurrection, at least, a suffering servant king. So they used the royal psalms, such as 2, 18, 72, 89, and 132, which were so clear about the victory of God for his people, alongside other psalms which spoke of intense suffering. Some, so, psalms such as 22, with its opening cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To create a different figure of a king, combining these two types of psalms together. The crown of thorns was as important as a royal diadem. The royal psalms served their purpose, but they needed to be reread in the light of the suffering of Jesus. Of course, in later Christendom, from the time of Constantine onwards, the image of the ideal king continued being remade into the divine right of kings by the, age of, by the time of Charlemagne in the context of an uneasy relationship with the papacy. Images of the ideal king, like David, are found in countless illustra illustrated manuscripts of the Book of Psalms from the Carolingian period onwards. And that understanding of kingship, more in line with the view in the Hebrew Bible itself, has of course continued up to the present day. Indeed, the Psalter of Henry VIII, now in the British Library, has various glosses written in the king's hand, which justifies actions against what he saw as the excessive root, the use of ritual, resulting, of course, in the dissolution of the monasteries. Although his handwritten glosses didn't include only the royal psalms, it showed how the figure of the king in the psalms was now of primary importance in understanding the monarchy, the British monarchy. Indeed, some of you may know that Coverdale's actual Bible contained a preface addressed to Henry VIII, comparing him to Moses, David, and Josiah, rebuking his earlier conduct whilst commending his repentance of faith. It was sent to England and perhaps surprisingly was given royal approval. But the other use of these royal psalms was more theological than political. I want to finish by helping you see the reception of the royal psalms from the monarchy somewhere between 1000 and 586 BCE up to the time of Jesus and into the development of the Christian monarchy hundred years later, actually is as much a theological as political issue. I've chosen Psalm 2, it just about fits the screen and one slide. 
First, I need to clarify again that this seems to be a psalm composed when a Judean king, not necessarily David, noting it has no Davidic heading, acceded to the throne. The psalm has probably been written by a court scribe for this purpose. The king's accession was accompanied by some rebellious coalition of other nations, perhaps Syria and Ephraim, seeking to undermine the throne of David. That's in verses one to three. Then God speaks through a court prophet, here not in judgment, as was often the case in the prophetic books, but typical of the Psalms, in affirmation of the Davidic line. He affirms, firstly, God's protection of Jerusalem, Zion, because of God, the king's presence there. And secondly, he affirms his special relationship with the king on the day of his accession, thou art my son. God promises the king victory in battle. That's verses 8 to 10. The psalm ends with two verses, which actually correspond with the beginning of Psalm 1, which at the end also speaks of the people perishing in the way if they do not obey the voice of God. So. Psalm 2 ends with a blessing on all those who trust in God, using exactly the same word for blessed, which the Psalm 1 starts with. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the, of the ungodly. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So in brief, Psalm 2 is a court composition composed during the monarchy when a Judean king acceded to the throne. It matches very much the events we associate with Hezekiah and the threat of the Assyrians. And much of the language here corresponds with parts of Isaiah, which deal with events at the same time. Whether it was King Hezekiah or some other king, the ending was added later, probably when the psalm was included in the Psalter, making it correspond with the teaching in Psalm 1. There, the emphasis was on obedience to the law. Here, it concerns the obedience of the king. Here, you see the story of Psalm 2 unfolding in this magnificent 12th century Edwin Salter, now kept at Trinity College, Cambridge. It says the image like this for every single psalm. You can see the hand of God behind the events up in the top. Here. Yeah. You can see the king on top of Zion. You can, see the hand, you can see the attacks on him being repulsed. And because this is a Christian soldier, you can also see the figure of Christ just above the, those figures going up the hill with a halo, and he's sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father. A more specifically Christian interpretation of this psalm can be seen in this St. Albans Psalter, also from the 12th century. Even by the time of the New Testament, Psalm 2 was seen to be about Jesus as the King Messiah. Here in the St. Albans Psalter, the scene is the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers come to arrest Jesus for claiming he was the Messiah, offending both the Jewish and Roman sympathies. Note that here he raises his arm with an iron rod. It's a reinterpretation of verses 4 to 7 in the light of Jesus Christ. This hostility against Jesus assumed the psalm, this assumed to be in this psalm, is explicitly referred to in Acts 4, where his psalm 2 is cited to recall the attacks on Jesus. And here, explicitly in Acts, it names both Herod and Pilate as representing the plotting of both the Jews and Gentiles against the Lord's anointed. Roger Wagner's depiction of Psalm 2 in a recent publication has the image of Jesus on trial in the center of the page. Roger Wagner's image is a clever reworking of the early Renaissance painting by Piero della Francesca. The ori original frame of this, the, the flagellation, had the words convenerant in unum, the assembled together, taken from Psalm 2, verse 2. Here we see Herod wearing some, a turban and Pilate seated with some sort of staff. The conspiracy against Christ is mirrored in the three figures in the foreground. One is the Count of Count Urbano, who was also conspired against and later murdered, and the other two with him, two of his betrayers. So Psalm 2 is now read not only as about to tax on an Israelite king, but on the king of Jews, Jesus himself. In this painting, it is also given a contemporary royal application. And so our journey through the royal psalms come to an end. Oh, sorry, no, we're not yet. Sorry, hand of the turned the page too quickly. Handel undoubtedly understood this psalm in a specifically Christian way. Here in the Messiah, he of course, she's of course an adaptation from Jennings, by Jennings of Coverdale's Psalter. We see just how 
this actually works out. And I'll play you just a short recording. I'm sure you know exactly what it is. And so our journey through the Royal Psalms comes to an end. We've seen how the Royal Psalms are a small category within the Psalter as a whole, linking back to the time of David the King, but including other Royal Psalms post-dating his reign. We've seen that because they date from the monarchy, the Royal Psalms also concern some 400 years of the Hebrew Bible's 2000 years history, when temple priests and court scribes compose these Psalms for the King to use publicly. And we've seen how the preservation of the Psalter, scattered throughout it and not kept together as a unified collection, has resulted in their being reread, first by Jews and then by Christians. We've seen how, uh, who would have come in, um, sorry, first by Jews and then by Christians. Jewish commentators saw the Royal Psalms as about a coming deliverer from the Davidic line, who would come in power and glory to deliver the Jews from persecution. Christian commentators from the New Testament onwards saw the Royal Psalms as about a suffering royal deliverer who was Jesus, the anointed one, yet nailed to a cross. Coverdale undoubtedly read these Psalms first and foremost as referring to Henry VIII, but even his words, taken up by later librettists, allowed for the more radical Christian reading where kingship is not seen to be about military power, but about, su about suffering and servanthood. So I hope I've helped you to understand a little about how the Royal Psalms give us important insights into, into how the, they were, the Psalms about the King were reused in different ways by Christians and Jews. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have a chance in a few moments to ask Sue some questions or to make some comments, but I wonder if Sue, I could ask you first. Um, our Queen today is obviously Head of State and also Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Do you think the Royal Psalms can give us theological insights into her role, therefore, the role of the um, monarch today? Yes, one of the things I was going to do in time for me to do it was to do the number of different psalm, Royal Psalms that have been used at various coronations and funerals. And of course, not only the Royal Psalms, but other Psalms which have got an aspect of um, authority and God's dwelling with his people and the authority of the temple and therefore the authority of the church that sort of is a type of that, um, which are connected with it. So had I had time, I would have, I had thought of doing a whole range of different compositions which actually show the use of the Royal Psalms from 16th century right through to the present day. I mean, even, even the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, it was extraordinary to see the use of three psalms during that particular service. So, yes, of course they do. I mean, all I said about their, the critique on, on kingship and, uh, and the monarchy itself, obviously, it comes from outside the psalms. In the psalms themselves, they, these are full of um, intentions to support and uphold um, the the authority of the monarch. So yes, they're an ideal more than any other piece of the Hebrew Bible one could argue uh, to use for, you know, for the, that divine right of, of kings and queens. Thank you. Could I ask um, 
people now, if you'd like to ask a question or make a point, if you'd like to use the, put your hand up using the reactions um, box at the bottom of your screen, or if you'd like to write a comment in the chat function, and then we'll work through the questions and hopefully Sue will be able to give a response to your questions. Brian Crow, who would like to say something first. So thank you for an incredibly uh, informative talk with a lot of food for thought. Um, I think one of the things that struck me most was that, that dual sense that the Royal Psalms can have, both of um, an expression of eschatological hope uh, in terms of how Christians think about it, but also reflecting the Jewish use of prayer of the Psalms, but also um, they can be grounded in political reality too, in terms of our hopes for how civil society is actually organized. And I'm wondering just something about, is there something about the fact that whenever we use the Book of Common Prayer today, we pray the, the Royal Psalms once a month uh, as we work our way through the Psalter. It, there seems to be a significance that we are praying in a way that reflects both ancient and contemporary mm -hmm. Jewish usage, but also ancient Christian usage too, that ensuring the Royal Psalms are said once a month in the Psalter of 1662 is connecting us with what is a very rich and enduring way of praying the Psalms? Well, you've, you've, answered, you, you've answered my question. If there was a question, I totally affirm what you said, that it's actually in reading the Psalms, it's that sort of sense of that month of recitation um, and that, that's certainly, as I read the daily office, that's exactly what I, I find important. I don't find common worship quite as helpful because it doesn't actually have that sense of a sequential reading in the same way. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that it keeps us in touch. It keeps us in touch not only with the royal psalms, but as we read sequentially through it, it keeps us in touch with the other psalms which are about human, ordinary human problems and disasters and hymns to addressing God you know, and it's, it's, it's the variety. It's like an orchestra playing the many, many different instruments. And then suddenly we may find, let's say, we'll attach the royal sounds with the cello. OK, but, but one particular instrument where suddenly you see that theme coming through in a in much more dominant way. And then the orchestra picks up and you have that other aspect. So the monarchy and the royal sounds are seen within the whole um, sort of the whole picture, panoramic picture. Of, of, of the life, not only of the people of Israel, but also, of course, of our life today as, as, we, as we live it too. So yeah, I, I'm, in one way, I'm quite glad they weren't kept in one particular collection because it, otherwise it would just focus it too much on the particular rather than seeing it within the context of humanity and, and, and the church as a whole. So no, but I, I totally affirm your, your, your view of the use of them through the, uh, yes, through the daily office. Thank you, Sue. Um, are there any more points or questions? Oh, Bradley, did you want to say something? Thank you very much, um, Rebecca, and, and thank you, Professor, for that uh, superb um, and, and very, very interesting presentation on the Royal Psalms. If one wanted to, um, to learn more, um, what could you recommend, please, that we should read um, that isn't going to be too complicated, that would follow mm. on from what you've taught us tonight um, to help us engage more deeply with these texts, please? Yes, my goodness me. Um, I'm always asked to think of a, a, a short Psalms book which will actually have, have everything in it. I should have got some of my library out and then and, and it would have come to give me a minute to think of that, because the, whatever I say, I will then possibly regret um, in terms of. Um, yeah, it, it just on the Royal Psalms, there's a, there's a. There is the thing that what made it so difficult for me in preparing this is there is very little on the Royal Psalms as a genre on their own of starting from the ancient um, period up to the present day. So I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit caught. I mean, I could be very naughty and um, say that 
my commentary, the reception history commentary, um, has uh, obviously takes each of the, all the psalms, but has uh, probably some of the longest um, psalms that I refer to are indeed the royal psalms because they're so rich in Christian tradition as well as Jewish tradition. So that's uh, the psalms through the centuries. Um, uh, the book I'm, I'm, I'm I've, is coming in three volumes would be one that where you would indeed find um, something on on that um, commentary of psalm by psalm. Um, you've caught me in terms of one specific book because there, I, to my knowledge, and I've got quite a big library of psalms, there isn't one single book that's just on the royal psalms as such. Maybe I could email you if I can find one. And, I, I, and actually going through preparing for this, I did look through my library and, and was surprised how little I could, I could find on, on, the, on just that topic. And I realized what a difficult topic you give me. When I picked it up, I thought this is quite, oh, I can talk about the Royal Psalms. That's good. Cool. My goodness, it's it's actually quite a tricky question. So um, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not. Um, I mean, the, can I can I cheat again? And and um, I'm a great fan of Malcolm Geit and his Corona of the Psalms. I don't know whether you you've come across that, the poet Ma Malcolm Geit, um, and. Uh, he has got superb paraphrases of these psalms, which are which which certainly bring out the theological and political and Jewish and Christian significance of each of them through poetry. Um, that would be another instant answer. But in terms of relating the book to the prayer book as well, I think I need to think quite carefully about um, about if anybody else has got anything. Why, I mean, let's cast it open. There's lots of people here listening. Let me cast it back to people, you know, who has anybody got an idea, a book they would like to recommend on this? Because I'm sure that uh, um, there must I be. I wonder if it'd be actually useful, Sue, even if you could just point us to a sort of general good book on the Psalms that looks at the Royal Psalms amongst all the other ones as well. So we can sort of see them in context. That might be useful as well. Yeah. That there aren't specific ones on the Royal Psalms, but I wonder if there's oh. a sort of basic one or two books you could point us to, that might be quite useful. I think I'd have to go right to my library right now and pick out one or two. So my mind is, isn't it strange? I've got so simple books that actually start with an introduction to the Psalter. Um, Bishop Stephen in our diocese has written some books on, uh, on the Psalms. Um, that certainly is, is one. I can't, the, the actual name of it, he wrote one. We, we all contributed, people in the Oxford Diocese contributed to it um, about two years ago. You caught me. Um, I wasn't aware I was going to be asked for, for further reading material. So, I mean, I'm very, very happy I'm, to follow this up and to send it to, to Bradley tomorrow and to say, okay, here are three three books. I would I would value, you know, would say, come at the top of my list that would be helpful um yeah. in fact someone's just put i'd rather do that than blather now and say oh i think this and then think why did i say that oh no that's right someone just put in the chat that john golding gay is good oh goodness <laughs> john <laughs> um, any other questions then or points that people might have to make yeah Oh, I thought you were saying, sorry, I totally misunderstood you. I thought John was here. John Goldinier was one of my tutors, actually. Long oh, ago, right. And now lives in Oxford. And um, and I thought for a minute you were saying John Goldinier is here. Oh, no. Question. No, 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 no you're no. absolutely right. Um, yeah, obviously, John, John's commentaries and John's works on Isaiah and his, and his The Bible Speaks Today series. That would be an ideal one. Yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. Um, Ian Milne, you've got a question, I think, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It was a fascinating one. It's one of these ones where it's quite difficult to formulate a question as you want to go away and check various points. You know. um, but um, um, one thing that did um, uh, occur, occur to me in this, um, I, I wonder if you had any um, thoughts on what light uh, these reflections should I suppose on um, the value of making the Psalms such a large part of our worship as the prayer book does. Um, one might, uh, some people might 
glance at the Psalms and think, oh, there's all this stuff about kings in Israel thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. you know, the point mm -hmm. of going through all this each week. Um, I won't try and preempt your answer. I don't no, I mean, obviously, there that. are only 11 Psalms which do talk about the, the, the king, kings of Israel, as I tried to say, or maybe a few more that we, uh, that we can't be quite clear about. And a lot of the other Psalms are very much more about universal experiences of, of people in all sorts of situations of, of, of um, you know, distress or, 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 or indeed of thanksgiving. So, so um, I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd want to move away from the focus just on the Royal Psalms as I did with the previous question and say, let's, let's see them within the context of the, of the Psalter as a whole and see how they actually uh, reflect the experiences which are much broader than just those of kingship. Um, and, and that would be one way. And, and again, just to affirm what, um, uh, what I said previously, that it's important that uh, uh, these, that within the liturgy of the church, these are read on a, on a daily basis in order to regain and to tap into some of the, of, of that sort of sense of the, they're, they're so ancient and yet so contemporary. Uh, that's really important. So, I guess I don't want, again, I don't want to focus too much on how we might use the Royal Psalms in that continual reading of the, of the Psalter, but how they fit into the pattern of the whole um, in sequence. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I'll give you one quick example. Psalm 2, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I gave that reference. Psalm 3 speak, is a prayer asking God to hear from your holy hill. And what we have very often in the Psalms is the picking up of a phrase from a Psalm before it and applying it to a situation in everyday life after it. Um, Psalm 72, a Psalm to the king, uh, uh, to, to ask the king to sort of uh, rule justly and, 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 and to consider the poor, is followed by 70, Psalm 73, which is a plea for justice for the poor in a much more general sense. And what we often find in the Royal Psalms actually, can, when you look at them in, in the context of their neighbor, actually form like sort of uh, pearls on a string, se sequential reading, which, which, which obviously we can, we can take a lot more from. So we see ourselves not only in relation to the monarch, but in relation to everyday experiences, um, uh, you know, of, 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 in heights and depths of, of, of human, humanity. So that would be my, my part answer. I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting the Royal Psalms to be seen as an exclusive um, list. I'm wanting them to be seen within the context of the whole. You gave me the Royal Psalms to do. I could have done something completely different on the heights and depths of human experience in the Psalter and how it's found in the reading of the prayer book. And I, I'm rather wishing I'd done that one instead. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul Morrison has written there in the chat that he says he reads the Psalms every day in his King James yeah. yes. Bible. Yes, that's Bible a very, yeah, exactly. And actually there are some very good yes. Bibles yeah. with, with footnotes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Actually, that are quite helpful, yes. aren't they? Yes, because sometimes you do need guidance, you know, on, on what it's a bit like the Ethiopian eunuch on reading Isaiah 53, you know. What is this about? It's just very difficult to try and make sense sometimes. And I think sometimes even Coverdale had problems sometimes because obviously he knew the, the, the Latin and, and the German and, and to some extent the Greek, but he didn't know Hebrew. And therefore, we, you know, sometimes it's a puzzle as to what, what, what a verse might mean. And you're absolutely right that the King James Study Bible can often help in that respect. Thank you. I don't think we have any more um, points or questions. So can I, on behalf of everyone. Oh, Augustine. Oh, we've got Augustine here. Oh, absolutely. You see, once you all start, if, if you only all joined in, I would find this much, I, I could not agree more. Some of those ancient fathers' commentaries um, on the Psalms are extraordinary. And actually, if we we're going to go to the 19th century too, the, there's a four volume commentary about Neil and Littledale, if you've heard of that, who, who those, who look at the Psalms through the writings of the fathers, of, of the many writings of the fathers. But yes, Augustine's commentary is, is, is with his theological emphasis and his Christ-centered emphasis is another way of being able to, to see it. He sees Christ the, as the body and the, and the head uh, in, in almost every Psalm, you know, the church 
and 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 uh, and Christ as Lord, and, it, and that is an extraordinary way of reading the Psalms, which is certainly quite powerful. Yes, well done, thank you. I shall thank have to give Bradley a, a shorter list tomorrow. But, uh, <laughs> and we've got um, Richard Bimson. You've got your hand up if you'd like to speak. It was just a, it was just an observation, really. I've just been uh, scurrying away. Um, in in Victoria's accession service for the prayers for her, for her accession. Three royal psalms are used, 20, 21, and 101. Interesting. Uh, but by the reign of Elizabeth, I, I, haven't, I haven't got anything in the middle to, 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 to see, but it's 21, the, 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 that psalm which you classify yes. as after battle, has been yeah. recorded by 121. And I, yes. I think, I, I, I suppose this must have been some deliberate conscious effort to reframe that idea of monarchy and thinking of that yes. like my help cometh even from the lord yes. and that idea of service and placing the mon the monarch in in a, in a bigger picture yes uh, yeah. i just i just i just thought that was interesting that there had been that that that, that change in the last 150 years yeah, no, that, that is really interesting because Psalm 121 is one of the ones when I was re referring to, to, to various compositions to, to Rebecca is one of the ones which, of course, is used many, many times at, 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 um, at the royal occasions. And yes, you're right. My help comes from the Lord who hath made heaven and earth. And that's very much the idea of the ideal monarch reflecting on their dependence upon God. Um, Psalm 20, 21 perhaps is more about the, you know, the, the, the rewards for service, if you like, whereas 121 is more about the essence of obedience and humility, too. I mean, it's very much about the Lord is your keeper. You know, he will, you know, he, uh, he, your shade at your right hand and so on. And so, yeah, I think I think uh, I can understand how the two form an interesting complementary whole. Interesting about Victoria, I hadn't realised that they, there's a deliberate use of, of three of those psalms. In that, uh, in that case. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really interesting comment. And, and um, we just passed half past eight now. So can I, on behalf of all of us, Sue, thank you so much for a really interesting and stimulating talk. You said you wanted to help us to get to know and love the Psalms even more. And I've certainly found that really interesting and stimulating and I've just as I've been sitting here looking on my bookshelves for books I know I've got some on the Psalms here and thinking I must get those out again yes good acquaint ourselves we use them so often or every day in our in the daily office and yet some sometimes they wash over you a bit yes it's reading and understanding that's what I'm absolutely trying to do yeah, and, using and your take, imagination with information. Exactly, you've taken us on different levels in terms of the background and context and understanding, but also thinking a bit about how we've used those over the centuries as well. So thank you on behalf of everyone and, and very appropriate too in this focus on the Royal Psalms on this yeah. the Billy year of our monarch. So if we can end, I'm going to say, um, a, a prayer for the Queen. Almighty God, who rulest over all the kingdoms of the world and dost order them according to thy good pleasure, we yield thee unfeigned thanks for that thou wast pleased to set this our servant and sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, upon the throne of this realm. Let thy wisdom be her guide and let thine arm strengthen her. Let truth and justice, holiness and righteousness Peace and charity abound in her days. Direct all her counsels and endeavours to thy glory and the welfare of her subjects. Give us grace to obey her cheerfully for conscience sake and let her always possess the hearts of her people. Let her reign be long and prosperous and crown her with everlasting life in the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in saying the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And do remember that this will be on the website, the Book Society website from tomorrow, if you would like to catch up and look again. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.